Sir David Warren, thank you very much for being with us. Morning. Um, well, I mean, as I said in the introduction, I mean, it does feel as if the G7 is meeting at a time of crisis. What can be achieved at a summit like this? Well, the G7 was set up at a time of crisis in the 1970s when there was massive economic instability and volatility of currencies and it was in the aftermath of Watergate and a major US crisis. And so that's why these first six, then seven leaders came together to try and sort out or help to sort out the problems of the world. And it is important that leaders should meet. It's important that they should hear from each other directly what their country's interests are and what their concerns are and what potential solutions to these problems are. So this type of high-level summit diplomacy is crucial, as it has been in the post-war world ever since the days of the 50s and 60s with the, the nuclear talks between the US and Russia and so on. Um, but it shouldn't be forgotten that all of these discussions are prepared by officials and diplomats, and that that preparation is meticulous. And the issues that are being discussed are very detailed and very complex. And these are not necessarily things which can be solved by two great leaders talking to each other. So you have got a bit of faith left in diplomacy, which is good, good news, I suppose. Uh, well, I was Always. a diplomat for 37 years. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I, I believe that this is central to uh, the effective management of the world politically and economically. And we can think of examples in our lifetimes, uh, in the case of America and Russia, Reagan and Gorbachev, uh, in uh, the case, the country I know best, Japan, um, uh, between Reagan and uh, the Japanese Prime Minister of those uh, days, Nakasone, where a rapport between these two leaders was crucial to resolving many of the problems. But I don't believe that it should be seen as the immediate solution to problems which are often much, much deeper rooted. I'm interested uh, there with what you're saying about how the rapport between two people can be so important, because we've just heard, haven't we, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson um, saying a few words after their meeting. I mean, they were pretty effusive, really, in their praise. And I think what really struck me as well is not just Donald Trump's praise for Boris Johnson, but perhaps what he was saying between the lines about his relationship with Theresa May. I mean, do you think that these kind of relationships and how the leaders get on can really break through problems? Well, I'm sure the Prime Minister was wise to be effusive in his remarks about President Trump because it's not clear that President Trump really likes to hear a language which isn't effusive. Um, this is the sort of, these are the sort of words he, he wants to hear. Uh, and uh, uh, his uh, behaviour over the past couple of years with Prime Minister May, where he's been extraordinarily critical, indeed rude, uh, towards her uh, as she struggled with Brexit, is quite extraordinary from the leader of a major liberal democracy and a country that is a major ally of the United Kingdom. Uh, I think with the case of Boris Johnson and President Trump, uh, we have to bear in mind that the issues they're talking about, the possibility of a trade deal between the UK and the US, um, this is going to be complex uh, and it's going to be politically sensitive. And no matter what the President says about delivering a trade deal, uh, he's going to have to get any trade deal through Congress. And in Congress, he's going to find that there are um, senators in Congress, men and women, whose constituents are affected by the trade concessions that he's going to have to make in order to get agreement to the sort of trade deal that both sides want. Um, already, uh, Nancy Pelosi has said that there's no way in which a trade deal is going to get through Congress if it compromises the Good Friday Agreement and the status of Northern Ireland, uh, which is the backstop issue, which is such a problem for the British government. So Boris Johnson shouldn't count his chickens, is what you're saying? President Trump can't deliver a trade deal. Uh, I think that's the basic point. Just as he can't, as he tried to do last week, order American companies not to trade with China. Uh, that's, I think, uh, an important element in understanding the relationship between these two leaders. Of course it's good that leaders have good chemistry. Uh, nobody wants a relationship between two countries where the two people in charge can't stand the sight of each other. Um, but I don't think we should be misled into thinking that that delivers an effective uh, answer to problems which are much more complex. And these trade deals are going to be critical, aren't they, of course? I mean, Japan is another country, of course, that the UK is hoping to strike a trade deal with. How difficult do you think that would be? Well, uh, Japan should be one of the easier countries to strike a trade deal with, but that doesn't mean it's going to be instant. Uh, there is an EU-Japan trade deal which was signed uh, earlier this year, and that was after seven years of negotiation. I left Tokyo as ambassador six years ago, and uh, we were just starting the EU negotiations at that time. It's taken a long time to negotiate that deal with 28 countries, and the Japanese, who are very 
friendly and well inclined uh, towards uh, Britain are going to want uh, a little more from Britain negotiating alone on trade than they could get from the UK as part of the EU. Because we're smaller. Is that because we are, we are smaller. We're a large economy, a powerful economy, but we're a smaller part of the European Union economy with uh, which they wanted to and successfully negotiated a trade deal. And so uh, that that is complex because every detail of a trade deal affects a constituency somewhere in Japan and Europe, whether it's farmers, whether it's manufacturers, uh, whether it's part of the service sector. These things are not uh, treaties that can just be drawn up on one side of A4 and signed with the stroke of the pen. And of course, this is Boris Johnson's first major international summit as Prime Minister. So all the leaders are going to be paying very close attention to what he says on Brexit, trying to get a bit of a glimmer of where he's going to go, whether or not what his red lines are and so on. What do you think they're going to be looking out for? Well, they're going to be looking, as all diplomats look in their daily interactions, for clarity, consistency and uh, a sense of realism about what can be obtained. The Prime Minister is, in a sense, let's call him the chief diplomat of the United Kingdom at this summit. Um, his responsibility is to promote the interests of this country, just as all of us as diplomats promoted our country's interests throughout our careers. And so the people he's talking to will be looking closely at uh, how clear and consistent he is, uh, how well they understand the um, objectives that he's outlining, and how realistic that is in terms of his ability to deliver those objectives given the political situation at the moment in the UK.